and filmed, and also my notes and my screens will also be on the web, so you can download it. So you don't have to write a lot of this down. I have trouble writing, so I try to make this as easy as possible, because I do know when I have to write a lot. It's chicken scratch after the first couple of lines, and I can't figure out what I write. So, you know, not that most of this may be important to some, more important to others, but this is 17 years of dealing with this, dealing with support groups, dealing with crisis calls, and talking to a lot of patients. Some of this is just a lot of common sense, but we get so boxed into coping with the medical, the pain, how it affects our lives, sometimes we forget that we have to live at the same time. So some of what I did is just made an outline of some ways it might be more beneficial for us to cope with this. Now I will pace, I will let you know that I do, especially when I'm uncomfortable or in pain. The basic things you have to do is having CRPS or being a caregiver means you have to look at life a lot differently. It's like throwing a stone in a pond. It goes, the rings go out and out and out and it's going to affect everything that you do. Every part of your life, every part of your caregiver's life. So you just can't think the same way that you did. You can't think it's just going to be so easy to get in the car and run to the store or it's so easy to get the kids homework done or the laundry's going to get done because things have been affected differently. Saving time and energy and finding less painful ways of accomplishing tasks is a big thing. We tend to think in things in big chunks. We need to break them down smaller. We're able to do a lot more than we think. But sometimes we just have to break it down into smaller components and not be so hard on ourselves. We tend to be very hard and think that, you know, we need to do more, we need to do better, everybody else is doing so much more. For each person, it's going to be different. Don't judge yourself by everybody else. Just because that person can go shopping doesn't mean that you have to. You find your own way to do things. You find your own best way to make things work for you. We also concentrate a lot of times when we first get this, I know it was very common for me, was to say all the things I can't do. I can't do this, I can't do that, I, oh my god, I can't skateboard, I can't play soccer. Start thinking about what you can do. There's probably a million more things out there that you can do that you may not have thought of. Maybe there's something you really like to do, you just have to find a different way to do it. I like to draw. It was a long time before I realized, put a tennis ball on the paintbrush. I didn't have to hold it as tight. Instead of drawing little pictures, draw a big picture. You have to think, take things that you really love in your life and find ways to do it. Life's too short not to. It really is. And like I said, the big thing is don't judge yourself by everybody else. Everybody in this room, we all have pain, or you're dealing with somebody who has the pain. But it's all different. So don't just assume because that person is standing up that you have to stand up, or that because that person's accomplishing this, you have to do that. We're all different. It works different for all of us. Our pain levels may be different. Our caregivers may be different. Our treatments may be different. But you can't say it's the same for everybody. So try to remember that. Maintaining good relationships work, and I'm sure all of us know that. It's hard when you're healthy. Never mind when you have these components throw in. One of the things, empower yourself. Don't let other people always do things for you. If you can do it or try to do it, give it a try first. Then decide you can't. I know in the beginning, my family, every time I turned around, was there to help me, pick something up for me, open the door, turn on the stove. I'm like, let me try. If I can't do it, I'll ask but at least let me try, remain my own independent person as long as I possibly can, or as much as I can before I lose myself, because you don't want to do that either. Hurt versus harm. That's a tough one, because we're always afraid we're going to hurt ourselves more, or do something that's going, to, that's going to make the spike up. Sometimes you have to make a choice of how far you're willing to go to do something. Do I want to go to that wedding? Do I want to go do this? Do I want to drive the car and go watch a game? You have to figure out how much you're willing to do, but not enough to harm yourself. You have to find that balance. That goes back to the same thing as not judging yourself by somebody else. You need to do what works best for you, your family, your friends. And a big one. Just because you're ready to talk about it doesn't mean everybody else is. And this is a big one for me at home because they just see my face and they turn around and walk the other way because they know I got to vent, I got to talk about it, I got to say something. And it's like they might not be ready. They got their own issues. They had a bad day at work, they got a flat tire, they failed a test. You know what? Something's bothering them. They had a fight with their boyfriend, their girlfriend. 
And you know what, they need their time too. So make sure when you go to talk to them about something important, especially with coping with this or making decisions, they're ready to listen. Because otherwise, it's going to end up being a battle. They're not going to listen. You're going to end up being both upset. Your stress level is going to go up. And then you're going to hurt more, and you got nowhere. So take it slow. Make sure. Make an appointment. You know, on Thursday, we're going to sit and talk about how we're going to pay for the kids' college or, you know, all those fun things that you have to do that are stressors. And make the time so we have time to think about it and plan. So it's just not, you know, today's the day. We've got to do it now. And they're looking at you like, do what? And they're not ready. So you want to try to plan these things out a bit. And do not let having this syndrome define you. This is not who you are. You still have who you are. You have your intelligence. You have your personality. Find ways to bring that out. Find ways to make sure you're defined other than this syndrome. And I know it's not always easy because there are bad days. I have them. I have those days I don't get off the couch. I can't answer the phone. I don't get up. I live on my couch in my TV room because I can't go up and down the steps. But I've learned it lasts a little while, sometimes longer than I'd like. But that's not the end all. I mean, you have to realize there's probably a little bit more out there step by step. But don't let that always ruin your life or run your life. Don't expect everybody to understand this. Somebody who hasn't had chronic pain like this isn't always going to grasp it. They're going to say, yeah, I understand. I broke my leg. Or, yeah, I tripped and fell. Or, I had surgery. It's not the same. This is 24-7. It's relentless. And not everybody's going to understand that. Don't be afraid to take on new roles in relationships. Things change. And you know what? They would have changed anyway. Things develop. They don't stay status quo forever. We change. We grow. You would have done it anyway. Maybe not in this direction, but it still would have happened. So just don't always equate everything to this is what it should have been, because it may not have been that way anyway. Find new ways to interact and use all the means at your disposal. You know. You're the general of your own life. You've got an army of things out there that you can use. Find them and use them. Use technology. Ask people for help. We'll talk about that, because that's one of the hardest things to do, is when somebody says, can I help you? We don't know what to say. We don't know what to do. Communication is huge. Make sure you explain how you're feeling to people. We have buzzwords. Ask me how I'm doing, and it's a really tough day. It's peachy or ducky. And it means, leave me alone. Don't come near me. Don't talk to me. Give me my space, because I'm probably going to snap. You know, we know there's other words to go along the day, and we've worked this out over years. But it kind of stops a lot of arguing and a lot of stress and a lot of angst, because I have to explain I'm not feeling good again. I can't do this again. And so we just, you know, I'm having a ducky day. That's it. Just, you know, leave me my space. Dinner won't be on the table tonight. Don't ask. You know, don't ask for an iron shirt. Don't ask for anything. You open the mail. <laughs> Caregivers need care, too. And I'm so happy to see. I'm going to tell you. When we first started counting how many caregivers were here, we thought there was about 13. It's like triple that or more. And that is so wonderful. Because you're part of this, too. And part of this is it's, it, it's a job for you. You know, it's made up of many tasks, and some of it is not things you were willing to take on originally, or things you thought you had to take on. And asking for help is a sign of strength, not a weakness. If you were at work and you had a project and a problem, you wouldn't think twice about asking somebody to do something, look something up, find research, do something. But why is it at home? We're so cautious and careful about asking for help from the people that care about us the most, or that we care about. Break down tasks. Delegate. Things don't have to be big. The kitchen needs to be clean. Break it up into components. Today I do the counter. Tomorrow I do the drawer. You know, today somebody puts the dishes away. It still gets done. Nobody says you have to have the perfect house unless you do. And, you know, who has the perfect house? Who has the perfect spotless house? I don't think anybody unless you have a housekeeper. Oh, Jim does. Okay. And I've been to your house, Jim. So, um, you know, write down your concerns as a caregiver, too. You have, you know, this affects you. Write down what your concerns are, what bothers you, what you need help with. Maybe it's a night out. You know, maybe it's time for you. Go to Barnes & Nobles, read a book, and have a cup of coffee. Maybe it's going bowling, hitting golf balls. I don't know. Just something that's time for you. You deserve it. You know, you do deserve time away from all this. Even if your person that you were caring for didn't have a syndrome, most likely you would be doing it anyway. So don't feel guilty. Go do it. You'll be happier. You're happier, less stress, less pain. It's a nice cycle that we all know happens. 
Pain in parenting, I know, is very big. I have kids, so I have two. And one of the things you really have to do is open a dialogue with your kids, an age appropriate. So you can't tell the same thing to a five-year-old that you can sell to a 15-year-old. You have to be careful. But they need to know, and a lot of kids, they need to be reassured because they have wild imaginations, and they will imagine the worst without even you telling them anything. With them not knowing, they're going to think the worst. And it may not be the worst. You might just be having a down day. My kids thought every time I went in for a block, I was going to die. I never knew that until I read an essay that they wrote in school. So you don't know these things sometimes, and you really need to be aware. For school-aged children, keep their teachers and counselors involved. I used to go every year at the beginning of the school with a whole brochure and a pamphlet about CRPS, hand it to the teachers, the counselors, and say, look, my kids are dealing with a parent who has this condition. It will upset them. I'll tell you the days I'm in the hospital. I'll tell you the times that I have my flare-ups, because they're going to be upset. They're going to have problems in school. If you can avoid it, again, it's less heartache and stress for you. It makes your life easier. Oh, dear doctor, I know we all love going to the doctors. One of the things is keep a journal. It's hard when you have in between all your appointments to remember everything that goes on. And I just read a study where it says most doctors interrupt their patients within the first 10 seconds. So if you don't have your information together and somewhat organized, and I know that's hard for a lot of us when we're not feeling well and we think we only have our 15 minutes with our doctor, write a journal. You can tell them how many days the medicine worked or it didn't or I didn't sleep or something did work. Ask to fill out the paperwork ahead of time. A lot of doctors have it online. They can send it to you and you can fill it out or have somebody write it for you if you can't. I write terribly. They won't be able to read anything. So sometimes you can type it in or have somebody else do it. Get your questions and your concerns together before your visit. You'll forget them once you get there. You start on side comments, side you know, tangents, whatever else. You may forget the most important question you meant to ask. Like, can I, do I need a sleeping pill? Do I need to change my medications? Do I need a block? What new treatments are out there? You might get so wrapped up in something else, the most important things get sidetracked. That's why bring a pen and paper, or even bring another person. Be honest. If you don't tell your doctors the truth, how are they going to help you? Don't try to make them happy by telling them something worked when it didn't. Yes, you might have a really great friendly relationship with your doctor, but he's still there to help you. And if you don't give him honesty, he can't. And that means even with the bad stuff, I'm taking more meds than I should be. Well, maybe you're taking more meds because maybe you need to change them. Maybe something's not working. They need to know that. They can't help you if you don't help yourself by telling them the truth. Keep a list of medications. Some doctors, I have one, I love him. Every time I go, he asks me, what are you taking? I was like, I see you. And like every, you know. And so, you know, keep that with you when you go. Because sometimes, you know, they're looking at a chart that's an inch thick because they've been seeing you for years. That information's not right on top. And sometimes this expedites things. Bring your research. When you read about that super snail or you read about something else in some weird journal, that's, bring the research to them. They'll have more chance of looking at it if you do that than saying, oh, I read this wild story in some magazine that they have to now go find. So if you bring them maybe the website, a copy of the article, they may take the time to look at it. A lot of them really will do that. Home and hearth is another big thing, especially for us, those that are you know, stay-at-home parents that we now have to take care of the house. I found one of the biggest things, took a lot of training, but I put two lists on the refrigerator, one for groceries and one for anything else they needed. If it wasn't on the list, they didn't get it. And there was a lot of times there was upset in the house because something they needed wasn't there, contact eye solution or, you know, pens and paper for school. But that's not my job. That's theirs. So it takes a little training to get them to, and I started young with them, that, you know what, if you need something, write it down. Every day, decide three things you really want to do. It could be five, but I find three works better. Those are the main things. That's your goal. You can do a secondary list, too. But when you're having a bad day, something about checking off a list that you did something, you may feel better. You just feel like you accomplished something. And sometimes that's just what we need to break a cycle. It's like, wow, I feel validated. I did something today. Break tasks into smaller components. Nobody says you have to get everything done in one day, one hour, one minute. Work, do what works for you. If it means break it up in over three days, three hours, three minutes, you know, put the dishes away one day, put the pots away another day. Nobody says you have to do it all at once. Use message boards. We have terrible memories, or I at least do. I forget things all the time. 
It probably because I don't sleep well, I'm in pain, I'm dealing with a lot of issues. So I found it's best to have message boards. Write a note down to somebody you may not see for hours later because you're probably going to forget. And electronics do work for that too. You can email, you can text, just once it's out, once it's you've sent it, you don't have to worry about it anymore. You've sent it, you've communicated, you're done. It's one less stressor for you. Give a specific task to anyone who helps, offers to help. Why is it so hard when somebody says, what can I do for you? We go, oh, nothing. I'm fine. Keep a list of tasks. You know, somebody wants to go paint your front steps, let them. Somebody wants to put up that tree that got knocked over in the storm, hey, let them do it. Take out your garbage cans. I mean, keep some things around when somebody says, hey, what do you really need done around the house? I had a neighbor who did that. And every once in a while, he was a contractor, would stop by, what do you need done? Oh, I need to pull down the steps fixed to the attic, and he'd do it. It was all these little things that somehow were always needing to be done, and he took care of them. Plan for emergencies, they happen. I hate to say this, but they do. You have an emergency plan in your house. Have you thought about it? Have you thought of how you all get out? Have you thought of how you get out if somebody's in a wheelchair? Have you thought about how they'll get out if they need to take their medication with them? I mean, these are things that have changed in your life. Originally, when you made that plan, of course, if you have kids, they always send it home in school, make your emergency plan, it's fireman week, it's whatever else. We may have based it on what was current at that time, update it. I'm going to tell you, I've had enough, I've had Sandy back in the spring, in the fall. I don't know how many of you know about Sandy, the hurricane that wiped out a lot of New Jersey. We went weeks without power, weeks without being able to get anything. Destroyed a lot of the area. And, you know, then you have to go through insurance, all these other things. Everything has its place. Teach people to put things back. I know it's hard. I spend one day running around with a basket throwing things in it that are all in the wrong places. And then it sits at the bottom of the steps until somebody puts it away. But I trip a lot. I fall a lot. As long as things are put in their place and out of their way, it's less chance of us getting harmed. We don't need that other fall or slip or the toy or the cat toy or somebody's book or pen is laying on the floor. Teach people to put things back. Make it easy. Put a basket. Put a bag. Put something. And use available technology. Like I said, email, message, pictures, things that you can use to help you take care of your life. But don't depend always on technology. Sometimes batteries go, things happen. One of the things I did was I color coded. I know this sounds a little OCD, but I gave everybody in the house a color. You know, blue, green, red, orange. Everything on the calendar that was blue was one person. Everybody got a blue folder, that was their paperwork. Blue lunch bag, blue backpack. I didn't have to think anymore. They needed information, they could go to the blue folder and pull it out. I actually got smart enough to make them clear plastic so they didn't have to take the papers out and I could face their schedules and phone numbers so that the paperwork just didn't disappear. But how many times did I get asked, do I have a game, do I have this, do I have that? It, that gets tiring. We don't need all that extra. So try to find ways to make it a little easier. Have one person do the finances. I hate to tell you that was a major disaster in my house and we tried to break it up. It almost caused a divorce. So. Usually it is better to have consolidate if you can. Some people I know it works def different, but it's usually best to have one person, usually the person who is not dealing with lack of sleep and pain and all of those things that can make good decisions. You want to have them do that. And recycle paperwork. How much junk mail does everybody get? Tons, tons. Get rid of it right away. Get rid of it. There's no reason to keep it. I'm a, I'm a pack rat. So I, I have to make myself get rid of this stuff. But it makes the end of the week easier when I don't have all this paper laying around. As I said with unexpected events, some things you can do, videotape your house, walk through with the camera. It's really easy these days. And put the DVD in a safety deposit box. I lost my home to a fire and had to spend weeks itemizing every pair of socks we lost, every Christmas ornament, you name it. How much easier it would have been if I had just taken pictures? It's an easy thing to do. Keep all your important papers together the same way. What happens if something, you're the person that keeps them, and all of a sudden you don't feel well and somebody needs something, they can't find it? These are just common sense. Have an emergency phone or contact list, not on the cell phone. How many, you know, we go visit somebody and something happens and all of a sudden they have to call somebody. How are they going to find those numbers? How are they going to find your doctor's number when you have six docs listed in your phone or you have code names for people or you need to reach family. So have a list that's, that's a handy list that somebody can actually read and figure out who the people are. Keep an info book. I did it, we call it the orange book. 
sounds stupid, but we kept combination locks because we could never remember them. Um, you know, important information, phone numbers, passwords, stuff that wasn't really private, but just you constantly somebody was always asking you for it. So it was go look in the orange book. I don't have to remember it. You go find it. Same thing like in combinations for bike locks, schools, things like that. And in the kitchen, there's a host of gadgets. I like to cook. I like to bake. But there's a lot of things that are difficult. My hands don't work well. So I found all kinds of tools, jar openers, bag openers, skid-free bottoms, things that will hold my pots in place so I can stir with one hand. It's really cool. My favorite was the one that took the stems out of strawberries. That's the coolest toy ever. Um, Wide-handled tools. The wider the handle, the easier to hold. Same thing with pens. Skinny pens are hard to hold when your hand hurts. Find fat pens. I'm telling you, all these little things add up. They do make a difference. You only have so much energy a day. Why waste it on things that you don't have to? Use it for something you want to. Bread makers, quick recipes. Find those recipes that are five, rest, you know, five ingredients you throw together, instant meal that anybody can learn to do. Paper plates. Hey, this is we have to eat on plates every night. Paper plates are fine once a week, twice a week. Have a stool to sit on. I also find wider glasses. I can't hold on to tall, thin glasses. I drop them, I break them. So I found short squat glasses are much easier for me to hold on my hand. It's less stress. Have a stool. I have a step stool so I don't have to reach. So I don't, I'm not climbing on cabinets trying to get something down. It's only like a small one, so it's not a big step, but it helps. Crock pot is a saving grace. If anybody hasn't used one yet, I'm telling you, you plug it in, in the morning, throw stuff in it, and dinner's ready when you get home hours later. And usually, most of us tend to be lit worse later in the day when we're tired. Who wants to make dinner? When so and everybody's asking, this makes it nice and easy. And we have the right to look good. We do. We have the right to put on makeup, get our nails done, put on nice clothes that aren't wrinkled in a mess, and get out of sweatpants. We do. And a lot of medications wreak havoc on our skin, our hair, our nails. So find products that work. You know, read some of the labels. Read some of the magazines. It's helpful. You know, your hair stays healthier. It's less haircuts. Um, you know, dentists, annual checkups, sunscreen. We burn easy. A lot of us on these medications are super sensitive to the sun. So look for things that have sunscreen in them. You know, med you know the moisturizer in the morning so you don't have to think about it twice. And look at beauty aids and tools to help you with. There's a lot of stuff out there. If you really look, a lot of arthritis catalogs have great tools for your hands or holding things that make life a little easier, like blow dryers, straighteners, you know, all those fun things that we use. And wearing clothes. I know, I know sometimes clothes are painful. They hurt. I know when I flew in on Wednesday, I couldn't wait to get out of them. They were just driving me crazy after hours of sitting on a plane, shoes, everything else. So find one that works, dress in layers. As we know in here, it's hot, it's cold, it's cool, it's warm. So be prepared. I always wear like a scarf that I can use as a blanket or a pillow. I usually make it match, I try to, but it has a secondary function as well. You know, there's also tools out there that can help you button, zip on, hook jewelry. Because I can't hook those little necklaces anymore. I'm sorry, there's just no way those little clasps are going to work in my hands. And I found the best thing was a coat rack for coats, no more hangers. I was amazed how hard it was for me to hang up coats when my hands hurt. So coat racks, walk in, hang the coat, take it off, none of that I had to worry about. And shoes, get what works. I'm sorry, I love shoe shopping, but I can't wear half the shoes out there. I live in Crocs. They work. Not the prettiest thing, but they do work. And there's something out there called shoe stretch. When you buy new shoes, if you can find it, you spray it, it actually stretches the shoes. Yeah, it works really well. It does. Wear the shoes around the house for like 10 minutes with thick socks. Yes. I watch a lot of it. I watch a lot of late night TV too. Wow. Um, I think my husband's tired of turning the TV off at 6:30 in the morning and going, "You still up?" "Yep, I'm still up." Cuz like I'll slouch down on the couch trying to pretend like I'm asleep when you think, you know, cuz they'll stop asking me, "Are you awake? Are you awake?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I'm awake. I'm awake now." Now you ask me. So it's like I try to slide down, he'll think I'm sleeping and he'll just like tiptoe by and I'm going, then I pop up and he's gone, "You know, enough already." So, yeah, life's fun. You know, when dressing out to be the cold, you know, think about what's going to keep you comfortable if you have to be out in it for any length of time. One of the things I've found, mittens are better than gloves, body heat, plus they don't hurt your fingers. I'm telling you, trying on gloves or trying to find ones that work, that's brutal. My kids wanted to once get me a really nice pair of leather gloves for my birthday or Christmas. 
I couldn't find a pair to fit. My hands swelled so bad, I couldn't get them in there. So we had to give up and go for fancy mittens. I also found, you know those Thermacare heat wraps that they use for bad backs and stuff? If you have to be outside in the cold, those are the best things to wear under your clothes. They'll keep you nice and warm, because you know, heat back stays warm under the coat. Downy wrinkle release, best thing when you know. You don't need an iron, it sprays the clothes and takes the wrinkles out. One less thing you have to do. It's a little, comes in a little bottle. I always used to find it at Target. Um, and don't just shop in one department. Try men's sizes, larger sizes, maternity wear. I mean, a lot of times, yeah, we, where there are things that we have to find are more comfortable. Don't get delegated to one area. Try different things. Junior department, women's department, boys' department, men's department. I find socks are awful. Women's socks are terrible. They're so narrowly cut, men's socks are cut wider and better. Same with sneakers. And a little bit goes a long way. If you can, I mean, I know exercise is tough. A lot of us do physical therapy, but try to do a little bit every day. Just something. Get moving. Get the blood flowing. It's better for us. It's a healthy thing to do. Walk, yoga, aqua therapy. Um, I know take your vitamins or supplements. Make sure you check with your doctors, too, because I know some do interact with our medication, so you have to be careful. Usually your pharmacist will let you know, but just double check. And stay hydrated and eat a healthy diet. Read a lot of the health magazines. I know the controversy over gluten-free has been coming up a lot, but that seems to be a lot in the news lately. It seems they recommend giving it a try, then stopping and see if there's any difference. It's a non-invasive, it's not expensive. You don't need health insurance to try it. So, you know, sometimes it's worth trying. Relieve a little stress. We know stress exasperates this. It makes it worse. It's a vicious cycle. The more we upset, the more the pain comes, the more we hurt. Find a good support group. This goes for caregivers, too. You guys are stressed. You're dealing with stuff, too. Find a group. Find somebody you can talk to. Or get counseling. You know, sometimes a counselor is a good person to talk to, a non-biased person, somebody who doesn't have a stake in what you're saying and is just willing to listen to you. Meditate, do biofeedback, or sometimes just take a bath. Relax if you can. Research resources, all kinds. We have all kinds of stress in our life. Find, do some research on things that will make life easier for you. And ask for help, again, that's a biggie. Lighten your responsibilities. What can you give somebody else to do that they're willing to take on? And take time for you. You deserve it. You deserve to do something for you, to enjoy yourself, to enjoy life. Not just always because I feel guilty because I didn't do anything today because I was in pain that I don't deserve to go have some fun or watch a movie or sit and read a book because I choose to. We are entitled to do that, and we need to remember that. Empower yourself. Be your own advocate. You need to speak up for yourself. Educate everybody you can about your syndrome. The more people you can educate, the better you'll get treated. The more people who understand this, the better in general will get treated. People don't understand it. They don't understand what it is. They don't know what it is. So when we tell them, oh, I have this, I handed out more paperwork uh, coming from the airport to people on the trams and everything else going, oh, why do you have a cane? Oh, this is why. Where do you come in? Oh, I'm coming in for a conference. This is why. I met somebody who was a future anesthesiologist. I mean, you never know who you're going to meet that somebody may, you may have a huge impact on that person. A good night's sleep. Most of us don't sleep or sleep well. I don't think anybody, when was the last time anybody had a really good night's sleep? Anybody sleep more than four hours at a time in this room? Good for you. Anybody sleep more than six hours at a time? Anybody sleep more than two? That's about the average, I find. We sleep, we wake up. One of the best things they say is keep a dark room. We're very light sensitive. Once lightness happens, our brains start kicking in. So really, they say, take your alarm clock, turn it away from you. Turn your cable box away from you, or turn it off. Who needs the cable box on when you're not watching TV at 4 in the morning? Keep noise to a minimum. I know that's hard sometimes. If you have animals, they bark, they move, they sing. But noise does wake us up as well. Sheets and blankets can make a difference. I don't know if anybody tried changing the sheets or blankets, different types, different kinds, different contents to see if they made a difference. I actually found mine being ironed, believe it or not, made the biggest difference. All those little wrinkles drove me crazy. I felt them like needles and pins all night long. Had somebody iron the sheet, and it was like sleeping on glass. Little things add up. I mean, it's, you know, you never know what's going to work. Put your pillows to work. I have like a bounty of pillows. I mean, my, they're piled on the floor, literally. 
but there's one under the arm, one under the leg, one behind me, they do help. Use them. Has anybody ever tried a magnetic mattress? Did it work? I tried it for a while, and I was afraid to stop it because I didn't know if it worked or not. A, ma a magnetic mattress is actually, it's a big mattress pad made of magnets, and they do say mattress prom magnets promote um, circulation. So it was a way to help circulation when you were sleeping. Um, and I had it for years, and then I was afraid to take it off because what if it was working? And then it wouldn't work. So I left it on for a really long time, and finally said enough it had to come off, and I didn't find too much of a difference. But we also find we have a, a very big component, emotional component to time. So one of the other reasons about turning your time, your alarm clock around or not looking at time when you wake up is because we start thinking, I have four hours left to get up. I have three hours left to get up. I have two hours left to get up. And then your brain starts working. Don't do that. Don't look at the clock. Another thing is keep paper and pen next to your bed. So when those thoughts start going through your head, I have to remember this or tell the doctor that or do that, write it down. You no longer are forced to remember it, and your mind will start relaxing a little bit. And I know some of this sounds just redundant, and some of it sounds really simple, but when they all put together, they can add up. Sometimes scents help people help. They have sprays that go on pillows, lavender, different types. Aromatherapy, it's been proven to work. It may not work for somebody with allergies or asthma, so please be careful if you have that. But it doesn't hurt. It's not invasive. Give it a try. Melatonin, Super Snooze is a good name of one. It's got other things in it, and it does work to a certain degree. It will help you get to sleep if you can't get to sleep. It may not help you stay there, but at least it'll help you relax enough naturally to get some sleep. You know, the calming bath or meditation, there are certain yoga poses you can do. Be aware of the temperature of your room. Your room should not be warm when you sleep. They tell you really you should be cooler and have a lighter blanket on your bed that we do sleep better than when the warm is really warm. Something to do about the, what our body does when we're sleeping. And when it's too warm, our body just doesn't like it. And like I said, keep a pad and paper for those thoughts that forget to you. Like you're in the middle of lay down and go, oops, I forgot that. I need to remember to tell somebody that tomorrow. You'll stay up all night thinking about that because you're going to try to, for not, to forget it. Write it down and relax. Get some sleep. Fun and entertainment. Plan for pain, but try not to let it ruin your day. We know flare-ups happen, and they're going to happen when we least want them to do it. But if you kind of put on, plan that into your day a little bit, what if I have pain, what am I going to do, what's my alternative? It's not as stressful when you go to do something because you're already saying, okay, it may happen. I'm not going to let it ruin the day. This is what I'll do if that happens. The big threes, pace, plan, and prioritize. You don't have to do what everybody else is doing. You can do some of it. Nobody says you have to go to the water parks with the kids. You don't have to go do that. You're not most likely not going to do it. Prioritize what you want to do if you go visit someplace. You come here to San Francisco, you know, what's the one thing you really want to do? Make that your goal. Nobody says you have to see the bridge, the park, downtown, the wharf, the, all those things. Maybe you just want to see the bridge. That's your goal. Watch your alcohol on your meds. When we go to weddings and we go to celebrations, that alcohol can catch up quick. You know, one glass of wine might be great, maybe a half another. But just be careful. You never know what's going to hit you, especially if we're not sleeping and we're tired and we're stressed. It's going to hit you a lot harder. If you go someplace and you go into a party and you decide to venture out, thank the host early. So that way you can leave when you're tired. You don't feel obligated to go up and interrupt them later on. You know, we always feel like, oh, now I have to go say goodbye and I have to make a thing out of it. Don't. Come on early up. I'm so glad to be here. I may have to leave early. If I do, thank you. I've had a great time. And when you're tired, leave. Nobody says you have to stay all night. You got out. You had something. You did something. Take time during an event for a time out, even if it's your event. You're having Thanksgiving. You're having Christmas. You're having friends over. It's your child's birthday. Give yourself a time out. You're allowed a couple of minutes. Deep breathe. Just away from it all. Noise and craziness tends to make us jittery and our pain go up. So take a few minutes to get away from that and just relax. Dress comfortably. Bring wraps, like I said, or the scarves that I can use as pillows and extra wraps. Um, I once used a sling. I went to a wedding and I put a sling on that matched my dress. And everybody was afraid to hug me and it was the best thing because all day, at the last event, everybody wanted to hug me. Everybody wanted to shake my hand and hug me. And by like the first hour, I was crying. I wanted to go home. I was hiding in the ladies' room. So I said, this time, I put on a sling, and everybody was like, oh, you poor dear. 
And they stepped and they stayed like five steps in front of me. I was like, thank you, thank you, thank you. The same thing with the cane. Sometimes, you know, people see what with the cane, they'll tell the kids, oh, stay clear. It's like, thank you. You know, ask your table to be seated away from the music or the doors. I know I was having this discussion earlier about how much the vibrations from music drive me crazy. It's the loudness, it's the thumping, it's just after so long I can only take it. So I ask to sit in a table as far away from the speakers as I can. Because sometimes I just can't take it and I don't want to be near a door that I'm getting bumped into left and right or the temperature is going to change every five seconds because I won't last. And sometimes we feel bad about asking that, but if this is a family or a friend, they'll try to accommodate you as best they can. I mean, they'll understand. And then plan ahead on how to answer all those questions. If you haven't seen family in a while or people, how many of you the first, well, how are you feeling? How are you doing? And 50 times in a row, you're kind of tired of saying, I'm the same, I heard, I'm tired. You know, if I, think about how you're going to tell those people, I'm doing the same. I'm doing fine. I'm here. That's a good thing. And just, unless you really want to tell somebody all the details. Otherwise, it's tiring. It's draining. And that's not why you're there. You're there to have fun to have a good time, to see people, to chat and talk, not always dwell on how bad your last week was, unless it's somebody you really want to tell, a close friend or someone who's there. Dance if you want to. I danced once with my cane on the dance floor. I just decided, why not? I'm going to hurt anyway. Might as well just give it a try. I took the shoes off and said, go for it. And I paid for it a little, but you know what? I remember having a great time that night, and that was worth it for me. To say, you know what, for those two seconds that I got out there, I had a great time. I remember what it was like to go out and do that without having to think twice. Being mobile, walking with an aid, there's a lot of different ones out there, and I have to tell you, this morning I usually travel with a cane that is, um, holds light, what do you call it, reflective or glows in the dark, actually. And I usually travel with that because I'm in rooms that I don't know, and I put my cane down. I'll trip over it. And sure enough, the first thing I did this morning, because I didn't bring that glow-in-the-dark cane, I tripped over my cane because it's all dark. So I found they're hard to find, but they're worth it because you, they don't glow real bright, but they're enough that you can see them when you get up in the dark, that you can pick it up without tripping over it, find it if you needed to get up to go to the, late, you know, the restroom or something like that, or just get up you know, because you can't sleep and have to go downstairs. Also check to see if they adjust to your height. Some of these canes are really cool but they're not adjustable. So the minute you change your shoes or you walk around, or if you're tall like me, they don't work. I'm like, oh, that's the coolest cane I get home. Like, I just spent $30 on something that's not going to work for me. Is it folded up? Do you need it portable? Do you need to be able to fold it and put it in a bag under a table when you go out to dinner? I have one that I just use when I go to dinner. If we go out to a restaurant, it folds up, and I can tie it shut and slide it under the table because I've got tired of tripping waiters and waitresses or having to move it every time somebody came by. I've had some disasters, yes. You know, a good handle or arm support. Maybe a regular holding cane is not the worst or the best for you. Maybe one with the arm support is better. Try them out. See what works for you. Just because somebody has that green cane doesn't mean it's going to be the best one for you to use. A good rubber bottom is really good. Make sure there's a good support in there, because otherwise it's really going to take havoc on your shoulder, because that impact is going to go through every time. So make sure it's got a nice rubber bottom that you don't feel that jolt every time. Do you know, they even make one that for the snow that has um, little grips that goes into the ice, so if you walk in snow and ice, you don't slip. They make them for museums. Yeah, they make them for all different things. Like, research. Just don't grab the first one you find in a drugstore. You know, do, do some research. Go to a disability show if they have one, and they have a lot of specialty ones there. It's worth getting a good one for you. You know, the walker or the roll aids. Do you need one that you can sit on or that you can just walk with? Figure out what you need and find the one. I know I have those cool canes that have the chairs on them. I thought they were the coolest thing when I went to a show once because the woman could sit down every 20 feet. She didn't have to stand on the line. I was dying. I was like, I didn't realize I was going to have to stand that long. That was poor planning on my part. I don't know how many of you still drive. I know some of us can't. I still do. I have my handicap permit, always. I've had people stop me, block my car, and call the police on me because they said there was nothing wrong with me. And then I've had to explain and hand the paperwork and say, and once I just said, oh my god, I have this other thing that they've heard of, oh, you poor dear. And that was the end of it. And I said, you could have done that in the first place, but I wanted this woman to understand what I had. And she just didn't believe me, but. 
So think about what special needs. Does your auto need special needs? Is there some way you can convert your car? You know, so that you can drive with your hands or left-sided. Or scooters. I have a friend who has a scooter. He wants to set up scooter races. He thinks that would be the coolest thing to do. And I'm like, you know, that's a good idea. Why not enjoy it? Electronic locks and car starters. I just found a new thing to turn car keys because I'm having so many troubles turning up the car key. It's a nice big thing. There's a lot of stuff out there for your hands if you really go and look. Emergency kits. You know, make sure you have stuff in your car if you drive. A blanket, some water. You know, what if you don't feel well and you had to pull over? Make sure you have some stuff to take care of yourself. And your phone's charged, a phone charger. Electronic controls. A lot of cars, you can do a lot more things electronically now. Get a car that's more upgraded if you can and do that. I actually wrote a specialty bike, too, that they made that they actually took your weight where your strongest muscles were, and, they, and it's incumbent where you sit down and it's in front of you. But it was so that you could ride it with only pushing with one side. So I, didn't ha I wouldn't have had to use my right side. I could just use my left side, and the other side would just kind of go without any pressure. It was expensive, but I said at least the opportunity was out there. If I ever wanted to try it, it was something I could do. And watch your medications when you drive. Make sure, like they say in the bottles, you know how you're going to react with your medications before you drive. Some of us can take them, and we have limited reactions to them, and that's good. Some of us will knock us right down. So make sure before you start driving on a new medication, you understand how you're going to react to it. And traveling hotels. Uh, most of you, I think, have traveled recently, maybe no. Hotels will do a lot for you if you ask them. Tell them you have, you're disabled, you need special help. They'll give you a room, maybe that's on the first floor near the pool if you have kids. Maybe away from the pool if you don't want to be near the pool. Check all the amenities. Make sure it's handicapped accessible. Make sure there's not a lot of steps if you have to walk and you have difficulty walking. Check it out. Do a virtual tour. Most places have it now. Make sure that hotel is going to work for you. This is their job, too. They're in the travel industry. They want you to come there. They will work with you. We had no trouble asking them to bring in blankets and pillows and anything else we needed because they want us to be here. Ask about local, attraction, local attractions and deals. A lot of times when you go someplace, hotels can get you better deals. I always ask. It doesn't hurt. You know, sometimes they have, like, you know, the trams that go down downtown and stuff like that. Free transportation, discount coupons, and whatever else. And plan. I plan. I drive everybody crazy because I get, like, wherever we're going, I get all the brochures and sit down and figure out what time everything is and what we're going to do and when we're going to get there. And there's a day off and a day on. And Again, plan start to finish. That way I can figure out what we can do. Let the airline know you have special needs. This is a biggie. I was telling somebody that when I went to Newark, they didn't have my wheelchair for me. I was miserable by the time I got through security because normally the wheelchair would have taken me all the way through there and I wouldn't have had to stand. Come When I got here in San Francisco, it was here and it was the best thing when I got off the plane just to sit. Not in my squish chair, but to sit, stretch out, and not have to go haul my luggage someplace. Car rentals. If you're going to travel and you're going to rent a car and you have a scooter, a wheelchair, or any kind of device, is it going to fit in the car? What if they give you a condo car and it has no trunk? Something to think about. And bring your placard. If you're handicapped, your placards are good everywhere. But you say a lot of the car dealers have special cars for those that are disabled. They have special things in there. And you can ask. That's what I'm saying. Plan. Call. If you don't ask, you don't know. If you don't call and say, look, I'm disabled, I want to drive a car, I want to drive, these are my limitations, how can you help me? If you don't ask them that, they're not going to know. They're not going to know what your needs are until you ask, until you tell them. Like I said, bring your placard. Handicap parking is good everywhere. So bring it. Airport, I know in New Jersey, and park at short-term parking at long-term rates if you're handicapped. And you have a handicapped ID, so it's half the rate. I also know on the BART, which I traveled yesterday, which is the local transportation train, it's 50% off if you're disabled as well. And they didn't even ask for ID. They just said, OK. And that was it. We're like, fine. Two tickets. Let's go. Yeah. I'm going to skip through some of these things quick. <clears throat> like, try not to give up new hobbies. Find new ways to do it. I know it sounds easier done, easier said than done. But like I said, find different ways. Do some research. Break down a project. Who says it has to be done in one day? Or find a new hobby. There's a lot of things out there that you can do that you may not think you can. Um, let's see. Join a group, technology. This is one of my favorites. Just let me make sure I got to this before I got thrown off. 
You look fine in other comments. How many people, oh, you look fine, you look well, you look good. And like, and you're like, okay, I'm supposed to look like crap because you want me to? Right, and you know, I also think we operate on two levels. We deal with one level is dealing with the pain, and one level is trying to be social and active. And some days we can't do both. And those are the days people don't see you, you're home. So of course the days that we're well enough to go out, that's when they see us. So of course we may look a little better, because that's the day we felt well enough to go out and maybe go to the store or pick something up. We fixed our hair, put some makeup, or ironed our shirt, or I'm not wearing sweatpants from my co my son's college lacrosse team, or because um, they're nice and big. Or you don't look sick. Okay, what does sick look like? You know, does it mean I have to have a fever? Does it mean I have to have the chills? Does it mean I have to be you know not functioning? Or I read about this new project. Guess what it cures? You know, or I'm this new. They're always finding something that they want to tell you about. You know, this is great. Have you tried this? Have you done this? And you're just going, you haven't listened to a word I said over the last five years because that was five years ago where I was. <laughs> or I used to have chronic fatigue, or I used to have this, or I have this. I just got active and it went away. Why can't you do that? Why doesn't this work for you? And like I said, what works for one doesn't work for the other. That's always been the case. And what, one, one of the reasons this is such a difficult thing to treat is we all react different. So somebody's treatment that helped them may not help the person next to you. Oh, if you got more sleep, you'd feel better. Okay, I probably would. But how do you want me to do that? I mean, come up with a suggestion that works, then I'll try it. Don't, you know? I, I'm sorry to say, there's just so many comments like this. I'm sure we could list hundreds of them. And we get tired of hearing them. So sometimes it's good to come up with a snappy comeback that really just stops them in their place and makes them think for a second and not keep going. You know, I broke my leg, I know what pain feels like. Or, you know what, my back hurts all the time when I get up in the morning. Mine hurts all the time 24-7 for 17 years. I don't really want to compare notes, you know? <laughs> or, um, you know, all, always a comparison. There's always somebody out there who's trying to compare it to us. And sometimes you just gotta let it go. It's just not worth that argument, it's not worth the competition because they're gonna try to one-up you every step of the way. But some people truly want to be educated. If you find that time, try to educate them. Because sometimes, some when, right, some they do. And that may be like that old Brett commercial. You tell somebody, you tell, they tell somebody. And that information gets out there. Um, it's all in your head. <laughs> My friends have back problems, still manages to work. You just need to get a job or hobby. We all get aches and pains as we get older. Who was talking about that last night with me? As we all get older, we get more aches and pains. <laughs> And yes, I'm getting kicked off, so I'm going to have to stop. All of this information, and called good information and good reads, additional resources. And yes, many of us look fine, but it takes an enormous amount of energy to appear that way. It is up to us, CRPS, RSC patients, to be our own advocates and educate those we come in contact with. By taking steps and utilizing some of the tools and tasks we've mentioned today, you may find a better day. I mean, it's a combination. I don't think it's going to be one thing. It's a bunch of things together adding up that's going to make a day a little bit better. That's kind of what I suggest.